All right. Hello. I think uh, we are on online and um, participants are starting to come in. Okay. We'll start very shortly. Just allowing a little bit of time for everyone to to get in on this very interesting uh, day and report we have for you. So, welcome everyone. Um, today, the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, UN SDSN and Enel Foundation are presenting their report on how to effectively implement the European Green Deal and uh, how to do so in consistency with the SDSGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it's uh, going to be a very interesting report. We have um, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs with us, we have Simone Mori, and we will have Camilla Bausch, uh, who will be discussing uh, today's topic. And uh, we will also be showcasing it uh, at one point an example from the Italian National Recovery and Resilience Plan in order to demonstrate this national effort that's working to align the long term planning with the SDSGs. And I, I find that particularly interesting because it will allow us um, you know, to see in concrete how that might work. Um, and there's just so much to discuss today. Um, the ambitions are huge. Uh, as we know, we are living in an urgent climate and environmental crisis, and we need to pursue sustainability as best we can. Um, we need to respect the leave no one behind principle. Um, so the European Green New Deal needs to be implemented according to, um, as this report will show a holistic, a cross-sectoral uh, uh, approach. Um, and adopting the six transformations approach, which we will discuss later with Professor Sachs, uh, developed by Professor Jeffrey Sachs and others uh, to provide a model for policymakers to address uh, issues like this and very, very complex situations like the one um, we are facing. So I, I'm really, really very pleased to be here today and to be able to listen uh, to what the speakers have to say. So very quickly, um, a few things. Uh, so we're starting now, we'll end about 4.30. Um, people uh, who are coming in, I see the, the participants' numbers are rising. You can feel free to write questions in the chat. Uh, please use the Q&A chat. We have two chats that you will see on your monitors. Uh, so please use the Q&A chat for any questions you may have. Um, and at the end, uh, when everyone has, has, has had a chance to speak, we will be looking at the, Q at the questions and, and doing a Q&A session. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me... Um, maybe briefly introduce the speakers. I'm sure you're all here because you know uh, who is speaking and what we're discussing, but uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, obviously a uh, well-known professor, author, uh, advisor to governments around the world and obviously to the United Nations. Uh, he leads global efforts for sustainable development for climate safety and is a strong, strong supporter of the Green New Deal. And in his bio, it says a Medicare for all. So. Uh, he's an expert on public health and epidemics and has advised the World Health Organization uh, during the past 20 years and much, much more. But I mean, this is just a taste of, of his bio. We will also be speaking to uh, Simone Mori, who is Enel Group's head of uh, Europe and he's been since 2018. Uh, prior to that, he covered several managerial positions within the group, uh, responsibility at group level for regulation, for antitrust, for environmental and climate policies. Uh, in addition to innovation and carbon strategy. And from 2014, he has represented Enel's interests with regards to the European Union. So a perfect profile, uh, obviously, for what we are discussing today. And last but not least, obviously, we have Dr. Camilla Bausch. She is scientific and executive director of the Ecolo Ecologica Institute. Her main fields of research are environmental, climate, and energy policy. Uh, Dr. Bausch was a longstanding part of the German delegation the UN climate negotiations, so that's particularly interesting for us, uh, her experience in that field, and she has been active in the introduction, reform uh, of the emissions trading system in Germany, which, which is a very interesting system. I've been writing about it in the past, uh, and that, that's fascinating, um, and as well as ongoing developments of energy loss. So uh, Dr. Bausch serves as co-chair of the T20 Task Force on Climate Change, Sustainable Energy and Environment, for the Italian G20 presidency, which has just, uh, it has just ended this year. Italy has had the G20 presidency uh, this year. So uh, there you have it, uh, very brief sort of overall wrap of what we have uh, and what we'll be discussing and the people we will be discussing it with. 
so I would begin at this point um, with Simone Mori, um, who tell us a little bit more about this report that uh, is being presented today, who can sort of explain how um, it has evolved, how climate policy has evolved in the last decades, how we come to the Green New Deal. Um, and then I know uh, uh, he can also tell us a little bit more about the Italian example, which I was mentioning before. So uh, thank you for being with us and the floor is yours, thank you. Many thanks, Alexandra. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you today. Thank you very much for Trainer Foundation for inviting me to present now in the discussion. Um, let's start from uh, from uh, from Glasgow. You know? uh, probably some of you have spent a couple of days in Glasgow, and uh, being there, I uh, it came to my mind uh, uh, the 2009 uh, uh, COP in Copenhagen you know, for several reasons, not only for the let's say some logistical difficulties, which was uh, quite uh, evident in this case, but also because uh, looking at the COP from European eyes, there was a very strong similarity. In 2009, Europe came to Copenhagen just having closed the 2020 package. And the idea at that time was, well, let's negotiate, try, starting from a point of, let's say, uh, of, of uh, the idea was leading by example in some way. You know? we, are, we already define our own plan. We believe that we want to be the leaders, the moral leaders of, the, of this fight, uh, and the rest of the world will follow. Unfortunately, in Copenhagen, the rest of the world didn't follow. And, and, and the COP was a quite an evident failure, or at least the, uh, this was the judgment of the analysts. So looking at Glasgow, uh, there is a simil some similarity. Europe came with the fit for 55, not closed, but very well structured. Uh, and then the idea is, well, we came with our homework done, and we want to be in some way an example for the rest of the world. But I think that the similarity stops here. And there were very big differences, not only because in Copenhagen was knowing, and thanks to God, at least in Glasgow was not knowing. So you were, while, while queuing uh, outside, you, don't have, you didn't need to stay under the snow. But because uh, Europe came with a very strong position based on the fact that the stratification of policies that were put in place starting from you know, 2008, 2009, then modified to the, you know, the, 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 the energy union approach. So trying to be more tighter, closer, more coherent. The clean energy package accelerating in some areas starting to define targets for 2013. The European Green Deal, so the new parliament for an alliance commission, instead of uh, articulating, elaborating on what the previous commission did, defines a new plan, which is even accelerated after a strong and sound uh, cost-benefit analysis, demonstrating quite clearly that if you do the job in the proper way, the uh, achievement of European targets will be good, not only for the climate, but also for European economy and people. Uh, but also because uh, Europe put in place some specific tool aimed at uh, being not only, let's say, moral leader in this uh, process, but also technological leader. Also with some defensive tool, which makes some difference. I believe that it's very important to consider a couple of uh, points, which were an inherent part of the, of the package that European uh, uh, institutions proposed. Let's start from uh, the uh, concept of just transition. Just transition is a concept that Carlo Papa is here with us, with the Energy Foundation. We started to discuss about uh, just transition several years ago, probably before the, the, this definition became, uh, in some way, conventional wisdom in Brussels. The idea that in order to get the job done, you must have with you all the society. You may not have winners and losers in this transformation. You have to push in order to reinforce the winner while you have to take care of the needed transition, because the transition will be difficult in some region of the, 
continent in some specific segment of the value chain. And then we have to take care of that. We may not, you know, we may not admit that the, the achievement of this target may be, I mean, may, could happen while em, impoverishing a part of our society. And then introducing specific tools in order to support this transition is very, very, was a very, very important part of, of European uh, policies. And I believe that this will succeed because the tools that are uh, under construction are very, very relevant and punchy they will deliver. Second point, we may not uh, construct a decarbonized European economy and society just by importing technology produced elsewhere. Uh, you know, of course, the debate uh, in some way is uh, 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 has to take into consideration the experience we had in the past for some specific part of the uh, renewable value chain, especially the, the solar panel, which became quite suddenly a commodity and um, you know, largely important today. But this is not the destiny of our continent. I mean, we are starting to produce and, uh, uh, top end high tech, for example, solar. Uh, panels and uh, we may produce this in Europe. So while there is a high added value, we, we may reinsure a part of the production that apparently was uh, exported. But there, there is not only this. Uh, battery Alliance, a good example of a European cooperation in order to put in place to reinforce the European manufacturing in this segment. There are several, quite a large number of new large factories, gigafactories, which are under construction around Europe in different countries, Europe may play a big role in that. It's not, we don't have to take for granted that this kind of technology should be uh, left to other countries or other geographies. This is not, this is not reality. Uh, now hydrogen is another important step. The uh, green hydrogen, which is the solution for uh, deploying the the uh, decarbonization in the so-called health of age sector uh, relies on the technology of uh, hydrolyzers, which is uh, still a quite immature technology. We may play a big role. And again, the, the Clean Hydrogen Alliance is working out also in order to incorporate this kind of technologies into the European segment. So uh, on my side, you will feel a lot of optimism. We are very much pro, uh, in, in favor of these European, European measures. Also because as you, this was the core of your question about the Italian recovery uh, plan, because this is uh, having consequences on the decision that member states are, doing, are, are making. I mean, if you look at the European, at, at the Italian plan, but this is not, not only the Italian one, we know, but you want other plans produced in other countries where we are present, that's Spain, that's Greece. They are very much in line with what Europe is trying to do. Uh, renewable, uh, electrification, which of course, which is the, the, the best and fastest way to bring the decarbonized electricity to the final users in order to accelerate the uh, decarbonization of, of the final demand, energy demand, and also in order to uh, engage all the population, all the cities and all the society in this uh, big project and big effort. So without going into the details and the topics and the very topics of the plan, I believe that what is important is what we see now that in many regions of Europe, and of course in Italy, for sure, there is a very strong coherence between what the governments are putting as a priorities in their own plan and what Europe is defining in terms of a grand vision for the 2030 and then for 2050 for the carbon net zero carbon neutrality. Uh, vision. That's the reason why we are pretty sure that this will work. There is a big problem of execution. We are aware of that, which is an Italian problem, which is an European problem, permitting uh, red tape, bureaucracy, administrative constraint, fragmentation is still very present, it's still a problem, but we are pretty sure that being the plan homogeneous and uh, ambitious but realistic. And being the barriers, the constraints, very well identified, uh, well, I feel myself on the side of the optimist. We may deliver, we could deliver, and it's very good to deliver because this is going to be good 
for the planet, for the environment, also for your, our economy and our citizens. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for presenting this, this, uh, this part of the, uh, of the very important report between uh, the, the partnership that generated this report between the UN SDSN and the NL Foundation. I see that uh, Professor Sachs is connected. So welcome, Professor. Thank, Thank you very you much. Here. Sorry for the delay, but uh, it's a uh, trapped in Zoom world <laughs> someplace else. I understand. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, we, we, we've just gone through, as you as you know, uh, the report. Uh, Simone More has taken us through a bit, a little bit of the development, how we got there, um, the evolution, let's call it that way, and then a little bit about the applying the sixth transformation framework to the Italian case, but you know, he, he didn't get into the details as yet. Um, you, I, I would like to, to ask you about the six uh, transformations, obviously how to implement, how to get to this, the Green New Deal through the six transformations, if you could tell us about that part of the report. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Let me uh, thank uh, all of uh, my colleagues and especially the Enel Foundation for the partnership uh, on this and for all of uh, SDSN Europe, which is working hard to support the European Green Deal. Uh, first, let me say the European Green Deal is the most comprehensive framework for sustainable development on the planet. Uh, so I greatly support and admire what the European Union is doing and what the European Commission is doing to promote the sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement, and the conservation of biodiversity in a coherent and consistent manner. We can see from this work, it's complicated. The European Green Deal is not a simple document. It doesn't uh, lend itself to a soundbite. There is no 30 second elevator pitch of the European Green Deal. Uh, it is uh, very intricate. It's got many moving parts, uh, as Simone was saying, and as we know, decarbonization, change of land use, digitalization, research and development, circular economy, farm to fork, uh, it's a lot. Uh, and it's good that it's a lot because uh, the sustainable development agenda is really a complicated multi-objective process, a very ambitious one and much beyond normal governance. It's beyond normal governance because we're aiming not at one goal or one parameter, economic growth or unemployment or inflation, we're aiming at a uh, consistent set of solutions to massive environmental crises, climate change, loss of biodiversity, mega pollution, emerging diseases, widening social inequalities, uh, widening uh, crises of social trust, as we've seen on the streets of Europe and the United States in recent days, where we uh, are really in a fragile state of affairs, even with regard to basic public health measures. And of course, the desire for continued uh, progress towards economic well-being and convergence within Europe and across the world. That's a big agenda. And it's a little crazy uh, that the SDGs have 159 targets uh, and uh, hundreds of indicators. Uh, and these are uh, goals set for a decade from now or mid-century in the case of decarbonization. And that's also very, very hard politically. Uh, it's, it's hard to uh, even to keep an attention span uh, of uh, society and, po and uh, politicians uh, years ahead, much less to keep a consistent set of public policies. So that's why uh, we at SDSN have been advocating the idea of six big transformations, doesn't simplify it as much as I'd like, but six big transformations to try to encapsulate what is this all about? Uh, and uh, those six are uh, mainly around education, 
and uh, also the advanced skills for innovation as number one. Uh, health and well-being, obviously very pertinent uh, in the COVID era is number two. Uh, the energy and industrial transformation, that's both decarbonization and circular economy is number three. Sustainable land use and biodiversity and sustainable food systems in particular is number four. Sustainable urbanization as number five, because we are still in a period of mass urbanization. We're going to have mega cities in Asia and Africa, unlike European cities, which developed over the course of 3000 years. Uh, cities today have to develop in the course of 20 years and they have to get it right the first time or end up in massive uh, uh, crises of congestion, pollution, inequality and the like. And that means a kind of urban design and planning and uh, finance and construction in a very short period of time. Fortunately, Europe has less of that problem uh, because uh, it has the most wondrous cities uh, that have grown organically over uh, thousands of years. And so it's a matter of some updates uh, for uh, the, the new technologies, but not uh, fundamental uh, new building of mega cities. And the sixth transformation is the digital transformation, which on the one side could change our lives for the better, uh, enabling us to have better services, health, education, uh, payments systems, e-commerce, e-governance, uh, more leisure time, I have not, well, all of us to some extent have traded uh, online for our commutes during the COVID period. A lot of that will remain that we will do more work from distance, uh, more work in local neighborhoods, more work from home uh, rather than automobile based commutes. That's a good thing in my mind. Uh, but we know that this uh, digital transformation also will change jobs and eliminate a lot of jobs. It could potentially increase a lot of leisure, but it won't necessarily because the impacts could be so unequal. And it could lead to psychological addictions, manipulation, fake news. Uh, I'd say net net right now, it's a pretty close call what's happening, we see a lot of social disarray and destruction around the social media. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not prepared to enter the metaverse with Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, he seems a pretty unreliable guide to me and a pretty uh, flaccid thinker uh, that I'm, I'm not ready to trust uh, either my future or my children's or my grandchildren's future to Zuckerberg's uh, ideas. Um, and so th these are big challenges and big transformations. So the idea of our report today is to say, great, the European Green Deal is, is, is a fantastic framework. It harmonizes or maps into these six transformations, but we're also urging the European Commission <laughs> to use the six transformations as an organizing principle uh, or some variant of it uh, to keep the big picture, to help us keep track of what we're doing. It's a pretty close fit. Uh, there's a pretty good coherence, but it's hard to implement anything that we're trying to do. And so the six transformation framework is really an aid to implementation. It's to say, think of the challenges in the following way. Think of these as transformations, meaning 20 year changes of society, not next month, next year, not business cycle, but generational change. Think about the coherence of policy in that regard. Think about the financing. To my mind, it is think about more Europe, not less Europe, because all of these ambitions, whether it's a decarbonized energy system or a Mediterranean sea, which is ecologically protected, uh, or whether it is a 
Europe that is vibrant and resilient socially depends on regional cooperation, regional scale budgets, EU-wide budgeting, which is why I'm a big fan of the European Recovery and Resilience Facility. I'd like even more of that. So, Alessandra, that's the basic idea of uh, what we're after in this. And we see this as a basic uh, guidepost for future action, uh, not as a moment of decision, but as a framework uh, that can help to guide. And Europe's got it in the right steps. And now bolster this, make it work, and then take it worldwide because uh, every place in the world needs its own green deal uh, with similar structures. And we have to make it work in Europe because it's the place in the world most likely to succeed. Uh, it's uh, making progress. And uh, the spirit of our report today is to make sure that that progress uh, continues uh, in a very strong and resilient way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, definitely. We hope and we hope it will be an example for, for the rest of the world, hopefully. Um, all right. Well, I will then uh, I'd love to move on to Dr. Camilla Bausch, um, who is scientific and executive director of the Ecologic Institute in Europe. And thank you for being with us. Um, I think at this point, I, I'll let you maybe comment what you've heard so far from your point of view, um, you know, from your experience, what we've heard, and also, I guess, what you're seeing, you know, from your point of view in your data and in your analysis. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra, and um, thank you, Simone and uh, Jeffrey, for inviting me. That's really an honor and a pleasure. And um, it's it feels good to work in Europe right now because there is so much dynamic and so much to be done. So it's a good moment in time, while it's also a scary moment in time thinking of what is developing uh, around us. But like Simone, um, let me take a quick look back first. Simone took the worst moment in international climate no negotiations, the 2009 Copenhagen summit, let me look at 2015 quickly, which was a highlight and a year of breakthroughs for multilateralism. There, the Agenda 2030 was agreed upon with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement was adopted. It was both in the same year and the world defined ultimate objectives for its collective efforts and overcame the former strict divide between developing and developed countries. So basically, in 2015, we defined a common agenda for the world as a whole. However, we did that without a toolbox box to meet the challenges to achieve these objectives. So until today, we are working to define and pave the way towards the future we want to live in. Therefore, it's actually quite decisive for societies to advance the thinking and the policies to achieve these objectives. So this is what the report also wants to contribute to. And um, the report rightly points to transformations we need and um, how to make them successful and efficient. And for this, the report points to the need for policy coherence across sectors and branches of governments. So that's horizontal between levels of governments, so that's vertical, and throughout time. And I can just echo that this is correct. That also shows how complex that is. So we basically need targets, policies, measures, good governance structures, and anchors to guide us through times. And let me mention here explicitly long-term climate strategies because they have not been explicitly, but implicitly mentioned in the report, and they are something lacking yet in the Fit for 55 package of the European Union. So it includes long, the need for long-term strategies so we can actually align our policies in a coherent way. And as has been mentioned, we are also in a process of learning because transformations are fundamental and there are a lot of experiences we did not have yet. So as we, move along, we learn on a tight time frame. So basically monitoring and reviewing will be needed. And the report also highlights this. 
Now, while all of this holds true for all countries around the world, the report focuses on the EU and more specifically on energy and climate issues in particular, and provides a quite adequate description also of the status quo and the complex landscape and developments. So let me look at that also for a moment. Over the past few years, we have seen some fundamental developments, which I think in 2015, barely anybody Two interrelated game changers. The one is Ursula von der Leyen as a conservative president of the EU Commission coming in and announcing the European Green Deal as her core policy framework. So for the first time, an environmental issue, particularly climate change, has become a focal point for all policymaking, for the policy vision. As Jeffrey Sachs just said, the grand vision. So this framework, as it stands here, it's something unique and you wouldn't have seen that before. And it is an integrated systemic approach, which shows it's rather complex because everything is interlinked, but you have to break it down to not drown in complexity, to have this back and forth, break it down and then link it back. So it's coherent and tangible and actionable. That is a big challenge here. And the agenda of the European Green Deal is closely intertwined with the agenda 20, <coughs> sorry, with the agenda 2030, be it good health or well and well-being, be it clean water and sanitation, be it affordable and clean energy or climate change, just to name a few. Actually, the European Commission links 12 of the 17 SDGs directly to the European Green Deal. And as the report just published today mentioned, the European Green Deal represents the first model framework for addressing multiple SDGs in a coherent manner, in a coherent strategy, sorry, there was a quote. And it mentions it is an all government approach. I want to say it's even in part an all society approach and that links to what Simona has just said that all of society is needed and it's not only technology, it's not only governance, it's really these transformation need societal backing that is also mentioned in the report. Now, um, the second game changer was the agreement to become carbon neutral by 2050, setting a date and not saying 80 to 95%, but saying carbon neutral. Why is that such a game changer? Because before there was kind of a tug of war, which part of industry could remain emitting while others have to reduce. Now tug of war is over, everybody has to be in. That's the call of the day. So that is decisive. Nobody can escape the need to change. That was a game changer. So now with all of this on board, the report highlights some key opportunities particularly related to the recovery package, but also some key challenges. For example, the complex structures within the EU, the different views of member states, the different starting points, the different structural challenges in the member states, controversies evolving over, for example, the new EU taxonomy for sustainable action, including controversies over gas issues and nuclear issues. So one could add to these complex points mentioned in the report, some things Jeffrey just mentioned in his introduction. So reforms of agricultural and transport policies, debates over future-proof infrastructures, sector coupling, or the extension of the emission trading scheme. So overall, there's a lot of promising um, approaches on the table already and quite a bit of challenges still to overcome. Now the report highlights then Italy. It is overall a positive assessment of the Italian case. It points to the wealth of opportunities Italy has at its fingertips. I quote, Italy can leverage the abundance of renewable resources available, namely wind and solar, and with mostly mature technologies. 
end of quote. So that links nicely to what um, Simone just said. He is excited about the opportunities. And the report rightly says um, that Italy claims that 40% of the funds are dedicated to investments to combat climate change. But now to spill some water into the wine, there is an analysis of the green recovery tracker of the Italian case, which basically says there is a lack of appropriate support for crucial pillars of the energy transition, notably the expansion of renewable energy direct, uh, generation and direct use of electricity. And it warns from wrong lock-ins and actually finds that and I quote, Italy's recovery plan achieves a green spending share of 16% below the EU's 37% benchmark. And at the same time, we find, that is the report of the green recovery tracker, we find that 26%, that is 49.5 billion, may have a positive or a negative impact on the green transition, depending on the implementation of the relevant measures. So here there is some need also for the scientific community to follow up, to make sure that this, we don't know yet how it turns out, turns out to be good and the right direction. Um, I assume I'm running out of time, Alessandra, or do I have two minutes? You certainly have two minutes, it's fine. Okay, then let me turn to science because I was exited before the event that I could mention some words on science here. Science can make an important contribution in this context. I see four roles. A source of generating scientific knowledge and insights. A watchdog. A scientific advisor and a, as a convener. And actually, SDSN plays a role in this. But let me um, at also some structural point I find noteworthy for the scientific community. So science can create insights which become cornerstones in the political process. Think about the inter intergovernmental panel on climate change and its impacts on the international climate negotiations. Second, scientists can become part of the policy process especially formally, this has been quite trendy right now in Europe, considering the national climate laws where you have these experts commissions. And that is good. They help reviewing, they are neutral, they are outside of this policy realm, but still inside. And that includes also monitoring and assessment as the report rightly points out. Now, thirdly, I think we have to engage into new forms of research, in Germany we call it this transdisciplinary research, for solutions that work in the real world in short term. And that means to integrate stakeholders and their implicit knowledge into the scientific process. And secondly, to dare to develop new scientific methods like real world laboratories and alike to actually test what we think about to advance more quickly and learn with each other. Last but not least, I want to say we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to contribute to creating knowledge systems for the change agents we want to see. Right now, for example, a farmer who wants to change to become more sustainable is challenged because he doesn't have a good go-to point to understand what does it mean for the business model, for the finance model, what are the right technologies, what are the right techniques. So we need for all this transformation and knowledge systems up to the task. So this, so this means we have a lot on the table and we have a lot to do. So let's take it away and build the future we want to see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Uh, I think we can open our Q&A session. And, and actually, the timing is perfect because we have about 15 minutes. Uh, we won't be stingy with time. So if anyone has extra questions, Please do. So uh, anyone who would like to can post uh, questions in the Q&A. I have some questions in the Q&A. I have some questions in the <laughs> chat. Uh, I have questions coming from various directions. So here's one uh, from the Q&A for you. Uh, let me just open it. So 
Vili van der Brande, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I fear not, but I apologize therefore. So he writes that, you know, he's concerned about implementation. He says 2015 is six years ago. The improvement of SDGs is marginal. One third of the time is gone. And the indices are getting worse and worse with global CO2 emissions continuously increasing. So he's concerned, uh, you know, that you don't see real improvement. Each report predicts worse outcomes than the previous one and ends with, however, there is hope because we are human, I suppose, and we hope. Um, so he is for hope, but what year do you think the data will give some substance to the hope? Do you see this data improving? Uh, you know, is it still early to tell? Um, uh, perhaps we can start maybe with actually with Camilla on this and maybe then go back to the others. It's wonderful to be asked about the data when being a lawyer. I love that. So let's see what I can say about the data. I think being at this moment in time, we can tell two stories. We can tell the doomsday story, and we have a lot of evidence to back that up about trends in, in, in the energy sector, about trends in the agricultural sector, about emissions and you do have the data to back that up. But you can also tell the other story, and you do have data to back that up, about the future of renewables, about the drop in cost, about the drop in battery um, cost, or um, about the um, new exciting opportunities with um, uh, green hydrogen, thinking of technology, or with respect, and there you also have data to back that up. Just go to the website of the IRENA. Um, so that's the International Renewable Energy Agency. And you have some policy commitments which you have not seen ever on the table. So, and if people complain about Russia wanting and China wanting to become carbon neutral only by 2060, I can understand that you're not happy about that. But then I would say, at least we have a pledge on the table. We didn't have that before, and it was not very likely that we get one. So, or China pulling out of financing international coal. Of course, you could ask them to stop financing also national coal. And um, so I think we have room to tell both stories and how the talk of war actually ends will depend on how much dynamic we can create. And um, as you say, uh, we always end with hope. And there is a quote attributed to uh, Luther. So Martin Luther, so the, the German guy, not the American guy. And he said, if I would know that the world would go down tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree. And this is what gets me going because I think that's the only solution we have. And um, I don't find it for me very productive to focus on the doomsday scenario. Um, so, so I hope we work for the solutions and we'll be meeting again and then having even better data on the table. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, well, I'll, I'll keep circling back through our speakers. So now to Professor Sachs, uh, a bit of the same question, you know, are you concerned that we're not moving fast enough? And then I'll add a bit of my own because I did have a question as a journalist. Um, the costs, you know, I, everywhere I go, there's talk about the cost, the governments I've spoken to, obviously when you speak to, for example, I'm in, based in Italy, so you speak to Mediterranean countries, the south part of the Mediterranean, North Africa, they say, well, look, we have other issues to worry about, this is not a priority. But even when I was in France recently, there was an issue with the costs, uh, there's political tension, there's an election coming up. So, two questions then. One yeah. is, um, okay, the question asked by, uh, in, in the Q&A, you know, we're not seeing enough? Do you think we're not seeing results fast enough? And when will we see something? And then the other question is this issue of the cost. It's, it's clearly slowing things down. How worried are you about it? What can we do? Is there any way we can sort of overcome it? Uh, especially in countries like, like Europe, where you think, you know, we have enough money to, to do both, perhaps. To, to, you know, the, main, the, main, the, main, the main problem is not the costs. Uh, the costs of uh, running a zero carbon energy system versus a fossil fuel based system are pretty close. Uh, in fact, some analyses say that the renewable system will end up being net cheaper, not even a small, more expensive. It's not the costs. Uh, it is a lot about the uh, distributional consequences uh, and especially the interests of major fossil fuel producers. 
uh, if we were all fossil fuel using but not producing, so we were importing from outer space, we would choose to import the solar rather than the fossil fuel. The problem is actually with the fossil fuel producers uh, because that's where the lags are taking place. Europe is in the lead in part because it has very little fossil fuel. <clears throat> where it has fossil fuel, uh, it tends to get stymied. Think of uh, Germany and coal. Well, okay, good. Uh, the Coal Commission uh, said there'll be a phase out, but it was hard political work even for a very modest part of the German economy. Now, <clears throat> imagine if you're Saudi Arabia or Russia uh, or Australia. I don't have sympathy for their position too much, but I just have an understanding that <clears throat> we're up against mostly interests. Uh, we're not up against costs per se. We're also up against or, uh, complexity because uh, an energy transformation is not a simple matter. We're talking about changing power generation and technologies that use energy, such as electric vehicles rather than internal combustion engine or hydrogen-based steel making. Uh, these are uh, new technologies, actually, that are going to work, but they need development and improvement and their systems. So they are interconnected and they require changes of land use and other kinds of behaviors and so on. So part of the problem is the uh, impact on uh, political power, on government finances, on commercial interests. Part of the problem is the pure complexity of getting this done. A modest part is about costs. That's the exaggerated part by the vested interests. I do want to say I agree with everything Camila said, except uh, why pick on China, for example? Why isn't your normal reaction about the United States, which is much, much worse in behavior than China? Uh, the United States has no policies agreed by the US Congress. The US emits much more fossil fuel. The US is an entirely corrupt political system where large oil interests pay for the campaigns of Congress. And you know, we give the US a free pass because they're allies, so-called. Uh, but the truth of the matter is by constantly belittling China and so forth, we've created an aura that they're the enemy. I mean, Biden had a lot of audacity to go to COP26 with nothing at hand, no financing, nothing agreed by Congress, and then blaming China and Russia. That's ridiculous, frankly especially since the United States is responsible for 20% of the historic emissions. And we, have a, we had a nut for president who walked out of the Paris Climate Agreement. The man's a psychopath and he's still around in power. Every Republican is against action. Many Democrats are against action. So my only tiny uh, suggestion is call out the United States. I live here. This is really a deeply problematic country, extremely worrisome. I'm very afraid of what's happening in this country uh, in many, many ways. But what I don't like is the belligerency of the United States vis-a-vis -vis China, and then somehow piling on I mean, Camila said, yes, they made a, a goal, and, and that's good. And by the way, without the European Green Deal, China never would have made a 2060 goal. So this is a triumph of the European Green Deal. And if we negotiate properly with China and discuss and exchange ideas, it will become 2050. It will, because they can do it in 2050, and they should do it in 2050. I'm worried about the U.S., because we have so much political uh, power to obstruct that uh, this is a, a very serious problem. And because we're aiming to create conflict with China for all sorts of cultural and uh, domestic political reasons in the United States. So that's not really a complaint, Camille. It's just an observation that, uh, that, that uh, 
we have to be careful with how we discuss these things because really I'd much rather call out Australia, which is, acts terribly in this, uh, the United States, uh, just to start, because that's us, so-called, that's our side. Uh, and then I think if we deal respectfully and actually honor financial commitments with India, for example, India would do much more, but we've never had a serious financing discussion with India. I'm not in love, by the way, with the government approach on many things in India. So I'm not also giving a free pass, but I think the way we approach the rest of the world, lecturing them rather than doing our own work and not financing the basic amounts that we promised is one of the major reasons why we are uh, uh, not succeeding globally. If the rich countries had come with the 100 billion or it should have been 200 billion by now, then there would not have been the kind of COP26 we just had. So we should understand our role in the global process. I, I'm not lecturing, Camila knows every word of what I'm saying, So, but I'm just saying that we should phrase things in this way too. Thank you. All right. Well, certainly. And, and Camilla, if you'd like, I will give you a moment uh, later to answer. But uh, although, it, it, yes, it is more of a statement than, <laughs> than a question, I suppose. Um, but I wanted to get to Simone Mori because, um, well, first of all, there's another question in our Q&A. So Maria Emilia Burgos, she says, hello, I'm European Climate Pact Ambassador. Uh, I'd like to know how civil society and experts working on climate change can contribute with implementing the European Green New Deal. Um, and so in line with that, I guess my question as well is, you know, along with institutions which are leading these transformations, what other actors? Can you tell us a bit more about the other <clears throat> actors? So, you know, the industry, financial sector, citizens, consumers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and right. obviously, if you want to address what uh, Professor Sachs just said, please do. Uh, there is no censorship. Yeah, at all. Yeah, no, as I said, I believe that this is a, this is an a evolution. This is a deep transformation that you have to engage all the society. You need, you need everybody on board. You need, you need, you need companies. You need, uh, of course, decision makers. You need companies. You need uh, private investors, finance. Uh, <laughs> you know, we are working out in order to define a new uh, a new way of of clusterize uh, finance according to sustainable targets, which is even a more comprehensive view than the, 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 the most, you know, the, the established the green, uh, green board, for example, and uh, finance is, is going to play a very important role. But it's clear that without the engagement of the society, there is no way to, to progress because, well, uh, I, I try to connect the two, the two topics of the two questions because you, you may not go against a society which doesn't want to change. I mean, Gilets Jaunes is the top of an iceberg, but it's, it's true. I mean, I, I, I was saying in the, the debate, there's a, there's a quite semantic discussion about cost of investments. Okay, I, I, I buy the investment concept. At the end of the day, if you carry out a lot of investment today, you may have an impact on the average cost of life of citizens. So it, it, you have to manage it. You may not just you know, deny that this is something that has to be tackled. By the way, engaging the society means doing the right thing in order to sustain the development, for example, also from the point of view of skills, education, schools, we need, we really need people, young people, young talents, at all the level of, of, of the hierarchies of companies and the, and the public sector, able to manage the, the tools that you need, for example, Professor Sachs was mentioning, the digital. I mean, digital is an inherent part of the energy transition. And we have to, Create the competences, the distributed competences under to sustain and to manage this revolution. We also have to take into consideration, as I said, that for some part of the society, this will be a problem. I mean, if you are a, if you are a, a, a coal miner in a, in a Czech Republic or in, a, or in Poland or in Italy or in Germany, you, you, this is a serious problem that has to be managed. And again, the concept of managing the just transition also meaning. A, with scaling of people, financial support, uh, re-industrialization of, of areas that have to be, uh, whose mission has to be modified. And that's very important. We are more on the hardware side than on the software side. That's very important. That's a priority. Another point, well, you want to, we, we have to avoid uh, 
discrepancies and coherence. So I, I, we fully support, for example, the idea of, of European Union to introduce a border carbon adjustment for, in order to avoid, let's say, climate dumping on goods and services. This is very important. We don't have to uh, blame countries which are lagging behind. Uh, I, I, we have to take very seriously, the, for example, the concerns of India. Again, there were comments about India. You know, if you look at a per capita CO2 emission of, of an average Indian, I mean, there's a long way to go. We have to respect them. But we have to avoid that this long transition may become a way for promoting unfair trade, because again, and it would prevent our food society to be compact behind the, the, the effort of decarbonization. Uh, looking at the numbers, because I don't want to avoid the, the big, the big, uh, the big uh, uh, question about numbers, things are going bad on, or, or good again. I, I, as I said at the beginning, I tend to put myself on the side of half a, a full glass. But I mean, we did a, a, a huge work and technologies are there. Uh, so, I mean, there was a way to produce electricity at a cheaper, it's uh, cheaper than renewable, for example, that, that offers us an incredible tool, for example, for overcoming several steps. Look at Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa probably has to more than double its own energy demand in the next decade, hopefully, thanks to the demography, but thanks also to the economic development. They may jump several steps of technological evolution, exactly as they uh, have done with, uh, with the telecom. They may jump directly from no energy because we know, we know how many people in Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, still without any kind of modern energy access up to sustainable renewable-based energy by jumping all the steps of you know, fossil fuel, centralized infrastructure and so on and so forth. Again, technology. Is, 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 is there, and we have to take into consideration the evolution, the trend, not the picture. The picture may be in some way uh, disappointing here and there. I would say not in Europe, we have to look at that. I mean, the, the example of Europe is a very good example because it's the demonstration that the job may be done without reducing your competitiveness, without reducing your ability to create, grow jobs and GDP. Uh, of course, the I mean, time is different. Look at the dynamics. So the dynamics of um, carbon neutrality 2050, 55, 60 is an important topic. You need a target, otherwise, I mean, you don't create the momentum. But I would say, in this incredible transformation, it's a quite secondary point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for addressing almost all of the questions at the same time. So that was quite an, an impressive feat. Um, it looks like we've more or less reached the end, but I didn't want to end it there because it was so interesting. So if we could just quickly, I wanted to revert back to Camilla Bausch, uh, both because obviously Professor Sachs addressed her directly and also to say, look, how can we, you know, we don't have much time, but I just, how can we export this, this European model? I mean, you may say, okay, first we, we do this at home and then we see, but, uh, you know, if you can answer, answer the question of, okay, should we be calling out the people that aren't doing their job? Uh, is there a difference between, for example, some countries that can't because they're in a different situation economically and countries that are very wealthy and aren't doing what they should be doing? Um, uh, I realize we don't have much time, but I mean, I want to give you at least a chance to say something on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, um, as Jeffrey said, we are not in disagreement here. So where it's just, I think on a transatlantic panel, it's much better the American side talks about the American issues. <laughs> and um, one has to admit though, that um, just looking at the emission numbers, China is the biggest emitter at the moment, but per capita, the US and Australia are rightly called out today uh, by Jeffrey Sachs. And um, if you look at the dynamics, which were at the COP for language, evidently um, China and Russia were in parts difficult partners, but coming from a different starting point. So I think we have in diplomatic rear arm acknowledged that 
and those who were totally disappointed with Glasgow, I don't think they do it justice. I, I think um, they all the lead up, there was uh, some dynamic which wouldn't have been possible in the international rearm without the Glasgow summit. So I find that uh, promising. What I do not find promising, however, in the international realm is the G20. The Italy really tried to advance the G20 agenda combined with the UK, who had the G7 presidency, and the, they together had the COP presidency, and there was basically no progress within the G20, and they are responsible for 80% of global emissions. So that will be a challenge for next year. Germany has the G7 presidency, so right on Germany. Let's uh, build a good basis to then go to the Indonesian G20 summit and um, help to, to create a positive dynamic. And obviously, um, the US will have to be part of it. I guess we are right now so relieved that we have a new president to talk about and to act with that already that is uh, something we positively acknowledge. But to be frank, that's a quite low bar. Even though he has an excellent team, he has a difficult situation at home, and that will be the challenge to this presidency, uh, to his uh, presidency, to see if he can still deliver on what I believe he wants to deliver. Let's see if he can make the political tide turn that way. And just a last um, note on the just transition point, Simone, which you mentioned. What I find in the just transition very important that we frame it in a broad manner and also look at those who suffer under the current situation, be it from climate impact, be it from air quality issues, um, from coal, dust and the like, and say part of the just transition is also alleviating the burden of the current system of those who are actually not privileged enough to be able to move out of the way of, of these kind of problems. So the just transition is, of course, part of the co-worker debate, but it's also part of the other underprivileged people suffering under the current system debate. And with this, I hope we find a wonderful CBAM solution, which triggers a lot of positive dynamic throughout the world instead of a negative dynamic where fronts harden and we get out of collaboration because we really need a truly global approach, especially for, for uh, this transformation towards uh, 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 the economy of the future and the societies of the future we want, we want to see and we have at our hands. So um, let's make a good CBAM and embed it nicely in the diplomatic efforts so it actually works to the favor of the whole world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we're coming to the end. So I'm going to let Professor Sachs uh, end it. Uh, sorry, a bit quickly, because we really are at the end of our, but I just wanted to give you the one last word. And so, you know, let's end it a little bit more positively, perhaps, you know, would you still plant uh, a tree if, if you knew that the world was ending tomorrow? The world's not ending tomorrow. Uh, we, we, uh, <laughs> we, we should be planting trees. And uh, we should be using the G7 and the G20 process uh, because we need to. And I'm, I am uh, very uh, pleased that the G20 this year has the presidency in Indonesia, uh, a country that uh, has uh, a lot of determination and need for sustainable development. Uh, and I think it will bring developing country perspectives uh, to the forefront. And I really like the idea of uh, the German G7 feeding well into uh, the Indonesian G20. This sounds like a great plan. So I, I, I really like that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you to all our participants, to everyone who was online watching and uh, commenting and asking questions. Uh, and thank you for having me. Uh, as your moderator uh, for this important SDSN and Enel Foundation partnership. Uh, you can read the report online. There's a link in the chat. If you want to look at it, click on it. Uh, and please do. Uh, thanks. Thank you once again. Thanks. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs>